All whatsoever you do in word or in work, do all in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Jesus Christ our Lord. Words taken from the lesson for this feast of the Holy Family, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Last year in Belgium, a young and healthy woman of 24 years named Emily decided she wanted to end her life because of unbearable psychological suffering. Sad to say, to accomplish this, she obtained legal permission for doctor-assisted suicide. A documentary supporting this very bad, immoral choice was made by some Englishmen and posted on YouTube a few months ago. It has had over 100,000 views since. It is called 24 and Ready to Die. But as the time approached for the death-dealing injection, thank goodness Emily changed her mind and did not go through with this evil desire. She was not ready to die after all. It turns out that Emily has been depressed for years. A number of doctors and psychiatrists have worked with her to no avail. She was a hopeless case. They agreed that since Emily was beyond their remedy, and that since no amount of treatment could offer her hope of getting over her depression, she was a candidate for euthanasia even at 24 and in perfect health. The main psychiatric doctor states that her life does not have sufficient quality for her to go on. Hmm. In the documentary, Emily shows a drawer full of pain pills and psychotropic medicines that have not helped her overcome depression and self-hate. She also displays her arms all bandaged from her efforts to distract mental and spiritual pain with self-inflicted physical pain. In the documentary, she says this wounding of her arms was done to rid her of evil monsters she felt was trapped in her rib cage. In her apartment are seen a TV, a large collection of DVDs. She states in the interview, no matter what she does, she feels empty. She finds no peace. Looking deeper into her life, we find Emily was born in a family that fell apart. Her mother separated early on from her father, a violent alcoholic, causing Emily to spend most of her time with her maternal grandparents. As early as age six, she recalls dreaming of killing herself. How can a six-year-old dream of killing herself? It must be in the air in Belgium. After high school, she embarked on a theatrical career and moved in with a girlfriend in what she described as a very agreeable, amorous passion. This bad relationship was short-lived because Emily had deep depression that was causing many problems, and surely that only aggravated it. Finally, Emily confesses to having no faith and has no idea whether there is an afterlife. This young woman and her family are an image, they're a type, they're a symbol of modern Western civilization. Divorced, entertained, Drugged, doubting, impure, depressed, and in despair. Given what we have learned since Christmas Midnight Mass, it is clear we have what it takes to unravel what happened to poor Emily and how it can be resolved. First of all, we know the trajectory that God likes to use. Kiss me, draw me, show me. Bring me into the wine cellar and put charity in order in me. To initiate this divine trajectory that God likes to use, that leads to true joy, God kisses us with a grace. That's how it starts. We respond to the kiss. God draws us to himself as long as we do not block him. 
He then rewards those whom he draws by showing them things, namely truths, mysteries, and wonders of his church and his creation, things of time and eternity. And how good then it is to be Catholic, to know these things, to be shown these things. Next, God brings this soul down into his wine cellar where he puts charity in order according to J-O-Y. These are things we've learned. According to J-O-Y, J stands for Jesus. We put God first in all things, as St. Paul indicates in today's lesson. All whatsoever you do in word or in work, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. J for Jesus. O stands for putting others second. And Y for putting yourself last of all. And those who follow this trajectory of God and put charity in order of J-O-Y find that a peaceful joy, a spiritual joy, enters into their hearts despite any suffering they may endure in this life. This joy is greater than any wine, any bodily pleasure this world can produce. Now, as it turns out, the family established by God from the very beginning is one of his most effective wine cellars. In a faith-filled family, one that puts God first and others second and self last, divorce, depression, drugs, impurity and doubts and unhealthy entertainments are not found. Many families are struggling at this time and falling apart precisely because they're not following the ordering established by God. Many spouses have divorced and have left the holy Catholic faith because J-O-Y, that clear ordering, was not observed in their marriage. Bookmark that. We'll talk about that next Sunday. For today's feast, then, I beg you to allow me to speak once again on St. Lydwin, the 15th century victim soul of Scheidem, Holland, a place not far from Bruges, where Emily lives today. In other words, St. Lydwin is a fellow countrywoman of Emily. And what is more, Lydwin embodies the complete solution for this young woman and what she stands for, Western man. Factoring in what we learned on the Epiphany, that we need to look back in order to move forward, we can overcome what Emily is struggling with. This principle of looking back in order to overcome something present very much fits into how God works. He kisses us, he draws us to himself, but he requires us to look back at times before we can be drawn forward. Thus, he shows us what he has written and done in the past, that it is relevant even now in the present and also in the future. So recall how the three kings, after having been kissed by God, after having been summoned to the crib, with a special grace, were then drawn to the crib by miraculous star. They were kissed, they were drawn. But this star led them to Jerusalem where they had to look back. That is, they had to consult the sacred scriptures. They had to consult divine revelation. Only then could they move forward. And so once this was done, their guiding star returned to draw them the rest of the way. Oh, how important tradition is. We need it to go forward. We're going backward big time because we refuse to look back at what God has given us. Backward, I mean morally. So the solution for Emily, who symbolizes modern Western man, is to look back on St. Lydwin as the kings looked back on the prophecies of old. This is very important because one of the critical errors of modern man is his hatred for the past. He does not want to look back. And when he does, 
He sees only bad things that need to be apologized for or explained away. The unwritten rule of our time is this. You can do whatever you want, but don't you do what we used to do. Don't you do that. Do whatever you want, but don't do what we used to do. You can believe whatever you want, but don't believe what we used to believe. That's the unwritten rule of modern man. That's the French Revolution, folks. Hatred of tradition. Hatred of our past. Hatred of our ancestors. Very wicked. One of Emily's main problems, therefore, is she has no memory. She has nothing to look back on in order to overcome the problems of the present. The Russian novelist Dostoevsky rightly observed that a troubled man could overcome any difficulty life may throw at him if only he has one good childhood memory. That is what a faithful family does. It provides good memories so that children can someday overcome any trial. What is more, Catholics belong to a very good family. It is the Holy Catholic Church herself. We have all been kissed by God at our baptism and have been drawn closer to Him through the sacraments. And what is more, the Church has a tremendous memory that is very accurate and edifying and has the power to help everyone who is willing it can overcome any problem. Now, one of the church's memories that will help greatly, Emily, is that of St. Lydwin. Let me prove it to you. Recall how this saint was ice skating at 15 years of age, fell down on the ice and broke a rib. She was then taken inside, laid on a bed of pain that lasted for 38 years. This victim's soul ate only three days maybe even only three meals worth of food in 38 years and took almost no sleep, something like three nights worth of sleep over 38 years. What is more, she suffered from almost every illness and disease of the day except leprosy and she would not die. She even suffered from various fits and forms of temporary madness, seizures and apoplexy. Doctors came from all over Europe to attend her, giving her every concoction they could devise as a remedy. None could be found to work. She was a hopeless case. This is one of the reasons her life is so well documented. All these doctors were filing in to try to cure this incurable. Finally, one perceptive doctor figured out that the causes of her inexplicable condition were not natural, but rather were from the Lord himself, who chose her to be a sign of his church in a passion. He chose her ahead of time to be a sign for us too, and for Emily. Lydwin is still important now. All over Europe at that time, the church was suffering and bleeding from many wounds, including the first sprouts of the Protestant revolt in Huss and Wycliffe. There were multiple anti-popes. No one knew who the pope was at times. There were three. Many abuses were in the clergy and religious life at all levels. Black masses were being offered in secret places of the forest. The spreading of witchcraft and occult wars and plagues and many other things were going on. Sound familiar? Amazingly, even as she literally rotted away, she always gave off a sweet and pleasing aroma. When she died, her body returned to complete health and stunning beauty. St. Lydwin. At first, her response to the trial was to wallow in self-pity. She put why first. Seeing none of her prayers being answered, she became depressed. For nearly four years, she lived a self-engrossed, depressed existence. Who could blame her? 
unable to live a normal life of sufficient quality. And yet unable to die. Despair hovered over her. Meanwhile, her friends played and laughed outside and enjoyed life. It's not hard to see her trial. Why me? What could I have done to deserve this? If I were God, I would fix this situation. Maybe there is no God and no afterlife. She heard those voices. With the help of a holy priest, however, she finally awakened and responded to a kiss of the Lord and was quickly drawn into the heights of the spiritual realm where few have flown, such that she was shown many, many mysterious wonders. Kiss me, draw me, show me. What did the priest have her do to recover? She looked back most especially at the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She looked back in order to go forward, to fly like an eagle. It was the cross that enabled her to fly. It was this that put charity in order, joy in her life, J-O-Y, such that she could say one day with great assurance and confidence, I am not to be pitied. I am happy as I am. And if the recitation of a single Hail Mary would avail to cure me, I would not recite it. She quickly embraced the life of a victim soul, willingly suffering for everyone else she could, even begging our Lord for additional sufferings of every kind to bring more glory and souls to God. Give me more, Lord. It's almost incomprehensible. Of importance to us today is this. She was born in a good family. She was baptized as an infant and trained in the faith. Although she angered her father by resisting a marriage that would have been very helpful to the family because she had vowed virginity, she put our Lord first in her young life. This good father nevertheless became her pillar and support. In her most trying moments, she was abandoned by nearly everyone else in the family and her friends, but not her father. He loved her through it all and did not grow impatient with her. His kindness never failed even when the mother grew impatient and harsh. I hope you already see why Lydwin directly answers the problems of Emily. Emily's father failed to be there for her, whereas the father of the saint held the rotting and decaying body of Lydwin in his arms without understanding what was happening. Didn't matter. This is my daughter. I love her. With good fathers, the holiest of helpmates come forth to make reparation and expiation. With failures of fathers, young, healthy women seek legal suicide. Emily was not raised in the Catholic faith, the ancient faith of her country and people. Lydwin was. Emily complains of an evil monster in her ribcage. Lydwin slayed this monster with a sword of confession. Emily had no memory. Lydwin had a healthy memory of a family life, but much more in the memory of the church of which she became an image. With this memory, especially of the Lord's passion, she recovered. Emily has still to respond to the kiss and to tap into the memory of the church. Lydwin suffered more intense darkness and pain than Emily, such that no one would disagree that the quality of life of Lydwin for 38 years was nearly as far from normal as can be reached by a living human being. Emily gave way to unchastity. Lydwin remained a virgin, loving purity, saving it for the Lord. Emily has TV, DVDs, and drugs. Lydwin left her sick bed and decaying body in raptures and went on fantastic flights with her guardian angel to shrines of the church, the Garden of Eden, 
and purgatory, to see mysteries of time and eternity. The one is despairing in unbearable psychological suffering. The other soared into the heights of spiritual joys. The one has no peace. The other has eternal rest. But what is perhaps most telling? What is perhaps the best proof of God's efficacious trajectory of love is how St. Lydwin became a source of peace to the world around her. She was not appealing for legal assisted suicide, but helping others overcome suicide. She no longer wanted anyone to pity or help her. Instead, she helped everyone else. She was nothing. They meant everything. Among them were numerous suicidal people. Here's one story among many. St. Lydwin counseled a suffering lady to be patient. This poor, desperate woman married a brute of a man who often vented his ill temper upon her. Weeks went by with no noticeable changes after seeing the saint. Tired of this miserable existence, her patience at an end, the poor woman decided to end it all. But her plans were discovered and were undone before she could carry them out. Never mind, I'll try again, she said. And on her way to this second attempt, this time by drowning, she suddenly decided to stop by and see Lydwin, thinking to herself, she's always been so kind to me that I do not wish to die without bidding her goodbye. At this instant, Lydwin, surrounded by her nurses, exclaimed, Go quickly and open the door to her who is knocking there, for her heart is breaking. The wretched woman entered in and sank to her knees, sobbing. The saintly victim's soul said to her, Do not think any more of suicide, my dearest. Go back home, for the tyrant whom you fear is changed into the most loving of husbands. Relying on this promise, the woman went home, finding her husband asleep in bed. Without disturbing him, she too retired for the night. And the next morning she found a smiling man who no longer abused her. If it only lasts, she thought, but it did last. This violent fellow, by a miracle it seems, became gentle and pleasing from that time forward because of a victim's soul suffering. Their marriage had been restored. Emily, our hearts bleed for you. For no other reason than the solution to your depression is so near at hand. Found in the story of your own countrywoman, St. Lydwin. When Emily, that is, all Europe and Western civilization, responds to the kiss of God allowing herself to be drawn by him to the cross where Christ rules as king, the cross, the heritage of Europe. Only then she will be able to look back and be shown the power of this cross to heal and to conquer. Then Emily will come out of her depression, her doubts and despair and depart from this suicidal path and enter into the wine cellar where true charity is put in order. Peaceful joy will then arise. True joy that nothing of this world can suppress. An age of peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.